Well, I do appreciate you all being here tonight. Uh, wow, rainy, yucky. So I'm honored that you would show up to hear us uh, on such a cold, yucky night. I fear that it was probably the pie and not me, but I'll take it. I will say to start with, before I talk at length, that um, we had a little fun going through thinking about the real wives of Faith Bridge. Uh, <laughs> We really are just real people. Sometimes when you're married to a pastor, or you are a pastor, or when you're, as the three of us know, four of us know, uh, you have infamous PKs or preacher's kids, people have some ideas about how we're different. I hate to burst your bubble. I am oh so normal, painfully normal. Dan has a little sign in his office that says, remember, as far as anyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. So. Um, we are. We're so like you. I'm only up here because I am blessed enough to be married to Pastor Dan and, yes, his hair. <laughs> Who knew when he started growing it out, thank you, yes, that it would uh, be quite the phenomena it has been. He has loved it. Our girls have hated it. So, anyway, truly, the only reason that I have the opportunity to be up here before all of you is that I'm a pastor's wife. I am really no different from you, but I hope tonight that I can share something out of my heart that would encourage you in your walk with, with the Lord. Um, Dan and I have been married 18 years. It's hard to believe. We have three mostly precious daughters, Georgia, Adeline, and Vivian, and they're all three teenagers. Well, actually, the third one's not quite a teenager, but she knows how to act like one. Uh, and she listened to my talk tonight before I came, and she took points off for that comment. So, <laughs> I stand here before you mostly in my right mind and pretty much all in one piece, having three teenage daughters. That alone could be my testimony, and I could sit down. <laughs> uh, but I do want to share some other things as well. So as I was preparing for what I wanted to talk about tonight... <laughs> I had to focus on the word renew a little bit and see what, what do we need by that. After all, our, our brochure, our flyer said, renew your first love. Um, renew is, refi is defined as to be restored to a former state. So this brought to mind for me how my relationship with Dan can be a lot like my relationship with God in, in many ways. They've gone through a lot of phases over time. They've both changed. Tonight, I want to suggest to you that to renew our faith, um, we don't restore it to a former state, but we refine it, which means bring it to a state of more purity, to a purer form. I want to talk about how renewing our relationship with God is not to restore it, but to bring it forward even further. So, how do you renew your first love? How many of you remember being in love the first time? Yeah? Gets that little smile on your face. You know, the birds sing louder, the sun shines brighter, the colors are more vibrant. I remember well when I fell in love with Dan, uh, about 20 years ago. Oh my goodness, I mean, I know y'all know, because he's up here and you see him, but <laughs> I hung on the man's every word. I could not get enough time with him. He was pastoring at a church about 30 minutes away, and he would take off as early as he could from work and head to my house and I would spend hours getting ready because I wanted to be perfection when he arrived. I hung on his every word. I couldn't find a thing about him that was not amazing. Um, all that's exciting and fun. It just, you know, stokes your energy for so much. But the truth is, it's not love. It's infatuation. It's that early, oh, I can't stand it. But I remember looking around at older couples and thinking, it's kind of boring. They're kind of dull and settled. Maybe you'd see them at a restaurant, you know, and they're having dinner. They're hardly speaking. They're just eating. They're quiet. <laughs> they're just sitting there. Or they're sitting together in the mall on a bench <laughs> watching people. And I swore, okay, we are never, never going to be settled and boring like that. Well, here we are, 20 years later. <laughs> we are that couple. We're happy to stay at home at night. Him with his ponytail, me in my yoga pants. <laughs> Our girls can't stand it. Suzanne knows she has the same husband at her house 
Our husbands turn into pumpkins at nine o'clock. They're in the bed asleep by then. I kid you not, last week at 7.38, Dan said, well, I'm gonna go into bed. I'm like, what? <laughs> he was preaching the next day, so we let it slide, but yeah. Um, what I couldn't see then, and what I was, uh, I'm only able to know now after 20 years with Dan, is that what, men, what made to those who haven't experienced it appear as settled and boring <laughs> is in fact, or at least it can be in fact, a place of deep security. Uh, we've reached a place in our marriage that is not that infatuation point. It is a very safe and secure spot. What you can't realize early in a relationship is how much of yourself you're holding back. You're not ready to put your whole self out there and be vulnerable. Um, you're putting your best face forward. You are spending two hours getting your makeup on before he gets there. You know. <laughs> You spend so much time putting out there who you think you are, or who you want to be, that the real you is not always there. That's one reason we're encouraging our girls, even now as teenagers, that as they begin to look for a life partner, that they need to ask the people around them who know them best and love them most, what do you think of this relationship? Because you can't see those things early in your relationship that might be red flags for later. While it's exciting and it's fun, it can't go on forever. One day, <laughs> one day, hold on. While, <laughs> my daughter couldn't believe I was gonna say this. One day, while trying to quietly relieve your intestinal discomfort quietly, <laughs> you will accidentally be quite loud in your husband's presence. <laughs> and your perfect image is gone. <laughs> my husband says real women don't do that. Mm -hmm. Or, worse yet, you have a romantic date planned and you're upstairs getting ready and your husband unexpectedly comes into the room to see you poured into your nothing but your Spanx. Bye-bye <laughs> romance. I know my husband needs shock therapy after that. <laughs> real people, real life. But we do find that to connect, we have to be real. We have to be vulnerable, willing to show our spanks or our warts, as the case may be, um, because what most of us truly want is a relationship where we feel safe and loved unconditionally and permanently, not that someone will disappear on us. There are a lot of similarities between that and my relationship with God. A relationship has got to grow over time. If it doesn't, it will become dull and boring, stagnant and stale. Those early days of a relationship are exciting, but they've got their downsides as well. Who's got two hours to put on their makeup? Um, you can't always be up and on stage and happy. Bad times come. Learning to communicate effectively, to be loved and to love fully does take time and refinement to get there. What I didn't understand about those couples that I used to see was that the opposite of fun and exciting didn't have to be dull and boring. That's why one should never give advice or state the I will nevers when you haven't been there. I remember saying, I will never be one of those wives whose husband comes home from work to find her still in her pajamas with yesterday's mascara now under her eyes. It might have happened. I don't remember. In the same way, early in my walk of faith, I was just getting to know God. It was exciting but I wanted him to think the best of me. I wanted to put my best face forward. I didn't get that he already knew me. So I was holding back parts of me from him. He was available, he was there ready to love me unconditionally, but I wasn't ready to let him have everything. I remember when my best friend Betsy, who's a missionary and has been now over 20 years, was leaving for her first assignment in the field. She and her husband had a three week old baby and they were leaving for Costa Rica to live basically in the mountains of Costa Rica where they would not have access to the health care that we have here. Well, as you know, or you might know, I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner. Babies get sick, babies die. So you've got to have health care. And when I expressed my concern to her of, how can you go and take that three-week-old baby to the middle of nowhere? She looked at me with the most surprised look and said, God is sending us there. Why would he not go there before me and be there with me? Well, I thought, well, 
she knows something I don't, but I wasn't sure what it was. And I pretty much thought, girl, God gave you a brain. He expects you to use it. <laughs> but off she went. Um, she understood what I didn't, was, which was that God would be there all the time, no matter what. Over 20 years now in the mission field, she has more stories to tell than I could ever claim uh, faith-growing experiences. So she took the three-week-old. She then, they moved to Argentina. She had her second child on a stretcher in a hallway of the hospital because the delivery room door was locked and no one could find the key. <laughs> During her third pregnancy, she caught malaria, followed by dengue fever. So she was hospitalized in Tegucigalpa in Honduras where she caught, uh, caught cryptosporidium, which is a bad water bug, in the hospital. She was life-flighted home to Atlanta to be cared for during her pregnancy. And if that wasn't enough, she was snake-bitten uh, in the hills of Honduras <laughs> and endured a two-hour truck ride to get to the nearest clinic to find out if the snake was poisonous. She made it through all that. Her children are all three healthy and normal, as normal as any teenagers, and she has quite the stories to tell of how God indeed has been with her every step of the way. Her relationship with God was much further along at that point than mine. She understood the verse from Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But before we can reach that stage that Betsy's at, I think we've got to settle some issues in our walk of faith up front, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I think it's a lot like in marriage. When we enter a covenant relationship, whether that's with our husband or with Christ, we've got to establish from the very first, there is no exit ramp. Divorce is not an option. Leaving God and walking away is not an option. Research shows us very clearly that couples who enter marriage and think, well, if it doesn't work out, we can get a divorce, are a lot more times likely to go there. Um, when the going gets tough, if there's a door, we're going out it. So I think we have to establish very clearly that, that that's it. Uh, God is not just something I'm trying out. If he is, it won't last. Growing in our faith is hard. There are challenges that come. The Bible tells us in Luke 9.23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Does denying yourself sound like a lot of fun? Did you deny yourself out there tonight at that table? No. <laughs> Denying yourself is hard. You must decide once and for all, no matter what, no matter what the circumstances of life, this is who I am. I am Christ and he is mine. And there's no turning back. The journey is both exciting and challenging. And Jesus didn't promise us it would, promise us it would be a rosy walk, but he did tell us in Matthew 28, 20, that he would always be with us day after day to the very end. There'll be times of doubt, There'll be times of fear. There'll even be times of anger. But just like in my marriage, when the going gets tough, I have to turn towards my partner and move in to get through the rough patches, not turn away. Secondly, we must commit that Christ is the center of our lives. From prison, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi as their pastor, encouraging them uh, and explaining how he could be joyful despite the fact that he was in prison. This paradox lies at the root of how he lived his life. One would do well to imitate that. In Philippians 1, 20 through 21, it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But how do you reach the point of thinking like that? I think we arrive there by making Christ the center of our life, the center and core of everything we do. Not to live as work, not to live as family, not to live as to have stuff, not even to live as church, but to live as Christ. We have to filter everything through that lens. Life becomes whatever you put at the center of it. Paul put Christ there, and I want to work so hard to do the same thing. Many years ago, one of our daughters, in her zeal for evangelism, told a friend at school if you keep playing soccer every Sunday morning instead of coming to church, you're going to hell. <laughs> well, at my door that afternoon, after bus stop time, I had a visit from a very unhappy mother who lived in our neighborhood. Uh, she was understandably upset because her daughter was upset. And while I certainly don't condone my daughter's approach to reaching people for Christ, <laughs> 
One comment the mom made did strike me and in a small way please me. She said, I don't know what the deal is with y'all, but our family is just not all about that church stuff like y'all are. I was pleased to be known as the family who's all about that church stuff, but I was sad for her that she didn't understand what all that church stuff was. My feelings of being safe and being loved have grown tremendously over the years, both in my marriage and in my walk with God. Um, Many years ago, I would have been terrified to think about, what if I die? At this point in my life, I can't say I relish the idea, nor do I want it to happen tonight. But I can say that I have such a deeper understanding of the phrase, to die is gain. I would be with Christ. Now, my girls and my husband, would it be very sad for them. I would feel horrible for them, but it would be a party for me. Um, over the years, he's seen me, just like Dan's seen me in my spanks, God has seen me in some very embarrassing situations. Um, many of them I brought on myself. But he's never one time turned his back. He's never walked away. He's never stopped loving me. He's always moved towards me in hopes that I would move towards him. It reminds me of the times when my girls don't get the decision from Dan or I that they want. Um, They're mad. They're upset. They scream. They yell. I've even been called a meanie diva head. (laughs) While I understand their angst, as a parent, I can see the reasons for my decision that they can't. And I understand things that they don't. It's not that I don't love them. It's that I love them enough to do what's best for them, despite the pain it's causing them in the moment. It's because of that that I can watch their sad feelings and feel secure that I'm making the right choice. Picture your toddler. He wants a piece of candy and you've told him no. In his mind, it is the end of the world. He will die right now if he doesn't get this candy. You, on the other hand, know too much candy is bad for you. You'll leave sticky handprints all over the car, and you'll be unbearable this afternoon. So you say no. You know you're seeking the greater good in his life. I think that God is looking at me much the same way many times. My God looks at me and says, I know what's better for her. Even when I'm rolling around on the floor, kicking and screaming, he knows things I don't. He understands things I can't. Don't get me wrong, I still roll around kicking and screaming every now and then. Hopefully, though, these episodes are getting shorter and shorter in my life. I hope that soon I will reach that place where my love of Christ and my relationship with him is such a deep, safe, and abiding place that I'm ready to say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to gain. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. It just means so much to us to have you here and just to see and reflect on all the wonderful things that God is doing in each person's life. I'm sure that each one of you could come up here tonight and have a similar story of God's work in your heart. And so it's a privilege that we get to speak, but we know that God is at work everywhere in this room. And I wish that maybe one day we'll have a chance to hear your stories. Well, as I've been thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight and been praying through things, Ken and I have been talking about the importance of just pulling back the curtains of the Warline home and letting you look in and see that we are indeed real people with real lives. And so I hope that tonight, what I share with you about our home, about our family, about our real people, real lives, will be an encouragement and a comfort to you. In November, Ken and I celebrated our 12th wedding anniversary. And as we always do around that time, we were reflecting on how clearly God led us together 12 years before and how he used two very special people in our lives to lead us together. I was 30 years old when I met Ken and he was 35. And to say that we were ready to get married would definitely be an understatement. (laughs) Uh, At the time, I was working for the Ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ at their world headquarters in Orlando, Florida, and I was loving it. It was a great period of my life. Um, And at the same time, Ken had started Faith Bridge, and he he was about three years into Faith Bridge and 
things were happening and souls were being saved and lives were being changed and it was just a really exciting season for both of us. Well, somewhere in the middle of all of that, our dear friends, Tom and Georgie and Reitmeyer, who some of you know, uh, suggested that we might get to know each other because we had a lot of commonalities and seemed to be going the same direction, having the same mission in life. And so, of course, I lived in Orlando and he lived in Houston. So my first interaction with Ken was when I went on the Faith Bridge website and I eagerly searched out his picture. <laughs> and I was so enamored with him. But I wasn't so sure about that comb over that he was sporting at the time. It's just a little too, too much comb over. I think I've done a pretty good job with him over the years, I hope. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, but then I heard a couple of his sermons and I determined that he'd be, he'd be worth getting to know. <laughs> so it wasn't too long after that that we met in person and then eight months later we were married and the Whirline family adventure began. And it really was an adventure. You know, both Ken and I are big dreamers with big vision and plans and it was just so fun to get to be a part of what God was doing at Faith Bridge. It was so energizing and exciting. And we were just trying so hard to keep up with everything that God was doing. Things were moving fast. Well, it was about this point in our story when God began to slow us down. Now, the church kept growing and ministry kept happening and lives kept changing and souls kept being saved. But God knew that it would be easy for us as we were in the middle of serving Christ, to lose sight of Christ and to move away from intimacy with Christ. And he didn't want us to get so lost in ministry that we missed out on him. And so God gave us the gift of children. <laughs> and those children God has used to slow us down and to grow us up, quite honestly. He's given us two precious boys, Wesley and William, and our lives will never be the same because of them. Our oldest son, Wesley, has always been very lively, very active little guy. He was always moving around at full throttle and full voice from the time he was born. I can remember when he was just two years old, this boy was so physically strong that he could literally rearrange my living room furniture at two, including my large oversized stuffed couch, you know, and it was just amazing. But the strength of his will, that even surpassed his physical strength. It was just impressive. Well, Ken and I thought, well, this is all, it's just boy, it's all normal, it's all good. Until one day when we were stopped in his preschool, his uh, very kind and very exceedingly patient um, teacher pulled us aside and said, Mr. and Mrs. Warline, I just need to let you know that we feel like we might be picking up a little glitch in Wesley and and we feel like maybe you might want to have him tested. Well, that's a scary thing for a parent to hear. But sure enough, she was right. We went and had him tested, and we found out that, um, that there was not only one little glitch, there were a few little glitches. And what we've learned as we've traveled this path is that glitches usually don't travel so low. They like to kind of go in groups. And so... Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, each and every one of us. And I love the translation, the New Living Translation says that we are fearfully and wonderfully complex. <laughs> and we all, each and every one of us is. But our, my son Wesley is, is definitely the epitome of fearfully and wonderfully complex. And raising him has been a joy. There's so much laughter and so much fun. But at the same time, there are so many challenges um, that are so persistent. But God has used this season of intense parenting in our lives in a greater way than I think he could have used anything else to grow us up and make us more like Christ. 
Never in my wildest dreams could I ever have imagined that God would have led me down the path of being a parent of a child with special needs or challenges. Never did I dream that I would be driving three hours a day to and from his school for children with special uh, neurological differences. Never did I imagine that I would have to learn how to cook gluten-free food. I mean, I've just been trying to keep my family (laughs) glutton-free. It's hard enough. And by the way, if you happen to see my little boys uh, munching on a donut out in the atrium after church on Sunday, just give us a little bit of grace because we are definitely works in progress in this particular area. But never did I know the challenges that I would face uh, learning to help our son navigate through his sometimes overwhelming uh, anxiety and frustration or the need that that we would have as parents to teach him some of the basic self um, interpersonal skills, um, learning how to be self-aware or self-regulate, just the basic social skills that so many children are born with, but some just have a really hard time with. But you know, if I did not have these challenges, I really don't wanna know who, what I'd be like today. You see, I am truly thankful that God has put this child into my life and has allowed me to be his mom. And I am truly thankful that these daily challenges of parenting have drawn me to a deep place of dependency upon God like I've never known in all of my life. And you know what? God is changing me in this process. And for that, I can honestly say that I'm thankful. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, says this, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various kinds of trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance And let endurance have its perfect results so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And then in verse 12, it goes on and says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So James says to consider it all joy. Now joy seems like a really strange response to suffering and trials, and it is. Um, My dad, who is a wonderful Bible teacher, has often said that joy is not happiness. Happiness is an emotion that we feel when our lives are free from problems, which is pretty much never. But but joy is the emotion that we experience as we persevere through trials and as we overcome them, knowing that God is in control. You see, true joy is not found in the absence of trials, but true joy can only be experienced in its fullest form when we learn to endure and persevere through those trials. Now, the trials I'm talking about today are not a burned lasagna and a bad hair day. These are the kind of trials that seem to go on and there's no sign of of ending. And we have to learn how to endure and persevere. The word for endurance and perseverance in this, pas- in this passage is actually the Greek word for hupomone. And that word basically literally means to live under, to bear up under the weight of something, hupomone. And it basically says, I am not giving up no matter what. That's my personal interpretation of that. I'm not giving up no matter what. The picture that comes to my mind when I think of the word hupomone is of a weightlifter who's just got the heavy weight and he's lifting it up and it hurts and his muscles are shaking, but he's not putting it down until his muscles are built up. 
And that is what God is doing. That is how God can use trials. Learning to hupomone, learning to persevere through our trials is just like that weightlifter. We are lifting up in faith. We are trusting. We are believing. We are not giving up. And you know what happens as we hupomone? Our spiritual muscles get bigger. We become more and more like Christ. We're stronger. We're more equipped for what God has prepared for us. Now, I don't plan, I don't, I don't intend on letting you think that I'm some weightlifter or something, because as you can see, I'm not quite there. But and I've never had the dream of being in the WWFW. But one thing I have learned along the way is that muscles first have to go through the pain of being broken down before they can experience the glory of being built back up stronger. And I think the same is true with us spiritually. Sometimes God has to allow life to break us down so that we can turn to him, our trainer, and he can begin to rebuild us into the image and strength of Christ. This January, I signed up for a boot camp, a fitness boot camp, and it meets three times a week at 5.30 a.m. Now, friends, I just want you to know right now, I am not a morning person, but when I looked in the mirror and saw my 43-year-old body after Christmas, I decided we need a fitness boot camp as quickly as possible. So, well, already I have been very proud of myself for being able to accomplish some of the challenges that our trainer has put us through including this past Monday when she gathered together all of us middle-aged moms and said, ladies, look up at the Klein Stadium. She said, today, you are going to run up all the stairs in that stadium, up and down, and and then you're going to run laps on the field, and you're going to do push-ups. And she wasn't kidding. She wasn't kidding. And... I looked around at this huge stadium and I started calculating in my little brain how many stairs there might be. And quite honestly, I just think whoever built that place just put in far too many stairs, if you want to know my opinion on that one. Well, I started in and after about two flights of stairs, I was getting in my groove. I thought, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm feeling good. Then I looked around and I noticed there were so many more flights of stairs to go. And about halfway, I honestly started wondering if I was going to be able to finish this. Well, it was about that time I started to think, I'm going to have to pull out my super hoopomone today. <laughs> Especially when Mel, our trainer, felt the need to explain to us how to keep from vomiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She said, apparently, when you smile, the muscles in your face keep the reflux muscle from overacting. <laughs> and so I... I finished up that that run with a big grin on my face, and it really hadn't come off since. (laughs) So, well, of course, the truth is that joy and smiling are not a natural response for us when we are suffering, but it is the response of God. Why? Because he knows a secret that we don't. You see, he can see things that we can't see. He can see the end result. He can see eternity when all we can see is today. The key to experiencing joy in our trials is to learn to see how God sees, fixing our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is not seen. You see, as Jenny said, our lives here on this earth are like this. They're a breath. They're here today, and they're gone. But eternity, that's a long time. It's a long time. And through the eyes of faith, we can learn to look at trials as momentary, momentary, but so beneficial, as real, but lightweight, in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us when Christ returns. And that is true. You know what else is really helpful to remember when we're in the middle of life's trials? Is that our Lord Jesus himself 
had to learn to hupomone through his own trials. Listen to what Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3 says. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured hupomone, the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who has endured hupomone so that you will not grow weary. The key to joy in our trials is fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, I don't know what trial you might be bearing up under today. Maybe like me, you have a child who has neurological or physical or uh, learning challenges. Maybe you have a persistent illness. Maybe you have a difficult marriage. Maybe it's finances or depression or in-laws or your boss. I don't know what kind of trial you're persevering through today, but I do know this. You and I are not alone. Christ has walked this path before us, and he promises to go with us through it all. Remember what he promised to his special chosen people 2,700 years ago. He said this in Isaiah 43. He said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze because I am your God and I am with you wherever you go. And you know, he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we can claim that promise as our own. No matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, Jesus is with you. And so you can make it through this. You can persevere. You can hupomone. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we are humbled that you would care so deeply for each of us, that you would promise that whatever we walk through in life, wherever life takes us, you will always be there. We thank you and praise you that your love for us is deeper than any trial that we could ever go through. And we thank you, God, that you never waste a single trial in our lives, that you are growing us into the image of Christ, but that there is so much more, that this life is so brief, and that one day, and it will not be too long for any of us, we will see you face to face, and you will say, well done, well done, you hupomone through life. Here is your reward. Thank you, God, for your truth. We love you in Jesus' name.